Alrighty, we're going to continue with uh, our gas laws, exploring the gas laws. And we're actually moving on to chapter 4 in the textbook, and we're going to be looking at the combined gas law and Avogadro's law. These are pages 126 to 137 in your text. By the end of this lecture, you will be able to perform calculations involving the combined gas law. You'll be able to relate the law of combined volumes to Avogadro's law and you'll be able to perform calculations involving Avogadro's law and the concept of molar volume. So the combined gas law literally takes Boyle's law and Charles's law and combines them together. So we end up getting uh, this equation here. So we can now do calculations in which pressure, volume, and temperature are all allowed to change. With Boyle's law, temperature had to remain constant. With Charles's law, the pressure had to remain constant. Now with this combined gas law, anything goes. We can change everything, which makes it more uh, kind of real world. Now in terms of the algebra for these equations, I find working at or working with Boyle's law and or the combined gas law in this form is a little bit cumbersome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation and I'm going to multiply both sides by the inverse of this. I'm going to move all of my variables over to one side. So when I do that, so what I'm doing is I'm multiplying both sides by T2 over P2 V2. Again, same thing to this side. T2 on the top. P2 V2 on the bottom. And on the right hand side here, my temperatures cancel, pressures cancel, volumes cancel. On the other side, nothing cancels, but what I get is P1 V1 T2 over P2 V2 T1. And this is all equal to 1. If you look at that right-hand side, when everything cancels, anything divided by itself will be 1. But what this does is it gives us a version of the formula that is easier to, or the, the law, I should say, that's easier to work with. And so all we got to remember is that for temperatures, our second temperature is at the top, our first temperature is on the bottom. Otherwise, the one's on the top, the two's on the bottom. And so, just like with Charles's law, our temperatures have to be converted into uh, Kelvins. And here we go. So we're going to calculate the volume of a gas at STP if 5.05 liters of the gas are collected at. 27.5 degrees Celsius and 95 kelvins, or not kelvins, sorry, kilopascals. So, and here we make our list, V1, T1, P1, V2, T2, P2. And so we want to calculate the volume of a gas at STP. So we want a volume, and I'm going to make it my second volume, it really doesn't matter which one you choose. So we want to calculate this volume at STP. So the STP, so the volume at 273.15 Kelvin, so that would be the same as 0 degrees Celsius, and 101.325 kilopascals. So there we have our second set of conditions already done. That's what we're going to, that's the changes we're making to our initial set of conditions is that we collected this gas at 5.05 liters. That was the initial volume we collected. The initial temperature was 27.5 degrees Celsius. We're going to add our 273.15 and we get 27.5 plus 273.15, we get 300.65 Kelvins, and our initial pressure was 95.0 kilopascals. And now what we do with this handy version of our formula, so we put uh, P1, V1, T2, and P2, V2, T1. So there's our little 
version of our formula. This is equal to 1. And what we do is we basically take a look at the thing we want, we cover it up, and that's the version of the formula we're going to use. So we want to find V2. So what we're going to really do, and if I just make this equal to 1, uh, we're going to multiply both sides by V2. When I multiply this side by V2, multiply this side by V2. 1 times V2 is going to be V2. And V2 and V2 cancel. So kind of the cheat, if you like, for this is if you cover up the variable you're looking for, what's left is the formula or is the, the arrangement of variables that you're going to use. So to find V2, we're going to use P1, V1, T2 on the top and P2, T1 on the bottom. So V2, and we'll plug in our variables, P1 was 95.0 kilopascals. Uh, V1 was 5.05 liters, and T2 was 273.15 kelvins. We're going to divide all of that by P2, which is 101.325 kilopascals times temperature 1, which is going to be 300.65 kelvins and we're just going to run that through in our calculator and when we run all that through we get 4.3 4.30 liters and again we have three sig digs for all of our uh, information in the question uh, if we take a look our temperature went up, our volume went down, or our pressure went down. So, is our 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 um, volume? It might have gone up or down. It's hard to say at this point. It's hard to read, but it it's about the same. So it seems fairly reasonable for an answer. All right. So here we have a sample of gas that occupies. 355 milliliters at a pressure of 99.5 kilopascals and a temperature of 22. The pressure increases by a certain amount and the temperature drops by a certain amount. We need a new volume. So, volume 1 was 355 milliliters. Temperature 1 is 22 degrees Celsius plus our 273.15 get 295.15 kelvins. We need our pressure, which was 99.5 kelvins, or kilopascals. S silly Ks everywhere. And we're looking for a new volume, so V2 is equal to something. Our temperature dropped by 11 degrees, so temperature 2 is 11 degrees less, so it's going to be 2 84.15 and our pressure increased by 115 so 99.5 plus 115 and we get 214.5 so 214.5 kilopascals and when I take a look at my little formula here I have P1 V1 T2 over P2 V2 T1. Again, I cover up the variable that I'm looking for, so I'm looking for V2, and that leaves me with the version of the formula that I want the, to, to find my unknown. So V2 is equal to P1 V1 T2 over P2 T1. Plug in our numbers. And our initial pressure was 99.5 kilopascals. Our initial volume was 355 milliliters, and our initial temperature, oh sorry, our second temperature is 284.15 kelvins. We're going to divide that by our second pressure, 214.5 kilopascals and our 
uh, initial temperature, which is 295.15 kelvins. And if you take a look, kilopascals over kilopascals, those units cancel. Kelvins cancel with kelvins, and we're going to left with an answer in milliliters, which is good, because we're looking for a volume. And once we now run our numbers through, we get an answer of 158.5. And this is milliliters. And we have two sig digs for our temperature. So we're going to leave it as 1.6 times 10 squared milliliters. This should make sense to a certain amount. When we increase pressure, increasing pressure is going to decrease volume, so our volume is going to shrink. When we decrease temperature, that's going to cause our volume to shrink as well. So we started at 355. Both changes result in a decrease of volume, and our answer is a lower volume, so it seems to be a reasonable answer, and we probably did it right. All right, the respiratory rate of a person is 16 breaths per minute. One breath contains 500 cubic centimeters of air at 20 degrees Celsius and 99.5 kilopascals. Determine the volume of air correct to standard conditions an individual breathes in one day. So here we're combining a couple ideas. One is we're going to be using our ideal gas law, but the other thing is we're going to try and figure out how much air one person breathes in a day. So we're going to worry about that part first. And what we're going to see is we're just going to, or we'll figure out how much, we get 16 breaths per minute. One breath contains a certain amount of air. We're going to correct that to standard conditions. I think we'll do that part first. And then we're going to find out how much that is in a day. So we'll start with just converting to standard conditions. So we have a volume, a temperature, and a pressure. And we're going to convert that to a uh, a volume, and a temperature, and a pressure. And we know our all of our initial conditions our initial volume is 500 cubic centimeters. Our initial temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, or 295, 293, sorry, 0.15 kelvins. Our initial pressure is 99.5 kilopascals. We're looking for a volume under standard conditions, so our temperature is going to be 273.15 kelvins, and our pressure is 101.325 kPa. And so, same setup as before, our volume is going to be uh, P1 V1 T2 over P2 uh, T1. And so we'll plug in our numbers. Pressure 1 was 99.5 kilopascals, 500 cubic centimeters for our volume, and our temperature, 273.15 kelvins. And we're going to divide that by our second pressure, which is 101.325 kilopascals, and our initial temperature is 293.15 kelvins. Okay, so when we run those numbers through, we get 457.5, and we're looking for a volume, uh, cubic centimeters of air. So that's the same volume of air at standard conditions. And that's in one breath. So now we're going to convert that into the amount of air in each day. So we know that we have 16 breaths per minute. So we're going to go 457.5 centimeters cubed per one breath. We know that we have 16 breaths per minute. So we can convert the air to minutes, so 16 breaths. 
seconds. So we're going to multiply my bad dot equals times 16 breaths in one minute. We know that in an hour we have 60 minutes. So in one hour we have 60 minutes. So I'm going to put minutes on top so my minutes end up cancelling with the minutes on the bottom here in one hour and then times there's 24 hours in one day. And if we run this through, this is going to give us breaths cancel with breaths, minutes cancel with minutes, hours cancel with hours, and we're going to be left with a volume of air breathed in a day. And so let's see what we get. Alright, so when we run the numbers through, we get something really big. One, zero, five, four, zero, eight, zero, zero centimeters cubed. And we're only going to have two sig digs, so it's going to be 1.1 1 .1 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 times 10 to the 7 centimeters cubed which is about 10 million cubic centimeters of air every day. So there's just a, uh, a neat fact for you to pull out at your next cocktail party. Okay, so we're going to look at the law of combined, vol law of combined volumes. So uh, Joseph Gay-Lussac in 1808 measured the relative volume of gases involved in chemical reactions. So he was reacting gases with each other and he found that when you measure at the same temperature and pressure uh, volumes of gaseous reactants and volumes of gaseous products they were always related to each other by simple ratios of whole numbers. So what this basically means is that they were always like a 1 to 2 ratio or a 1 to 1 ratio or a 1 to 3 ratio. Simple whole number ratios between reactants of products and and reactants. Uh, this wasn't true for solids or liquids, so this was something new. And it led Avogadro to compare these coefficients with their balanced chemical equations. And what Avogadro's law, what he came up with is the idea that equal volumes of gases at the same temperature and pressure contain equal number of molecules. Or another way to look at it is it doesn't matter what gas you have, one liter of any gas well, it's the same number of molecules of gas. It doesn't matter what the gas is. And so here's sort of the idea. Equal volumes of an ideal gas have the same temperature and pressure and same number of molecules. So what we're looking at here, if we're looking at hydrogen gas, two volumes, or we could say two liters of hydrogen gas is two moles. Two moles of gas take up two liters of space one mole of gas takes up one liter of space. It doesn't matter what the gas is. In this case it was oxygen and hydrogen, but and here we have, here's the, the other one, two moles of gas, two volumes or two liters of gas. So even though these two gases are different gases, one's hydrogen gas, one's water vapor, two moles of gas take up the same amount of space regardless of the type of gas. Same thing with the example down here. Uh, the number of moles tell you how many volumes or how many liters of gas there are. So when gas is combined, the ratio of their volumes is the same as the ratio of their coefficients for a balanced chemical reaction. So once you balance this reaction, and we're going to be doing more of this in the next unit, um, two hydrogens, and when we balance it, we see there's four hydrogens on this side, two times two, four hydrogens on this side. Uh, two oxygens and two oxygens. So what this is saying is that if you look at the, the coefficient in front of each chemical, that number is the same as the number of moles of gas, or the number of, is the, the ratio is the same. And so what this means is as more gas enters a container, the increase in the number of molecules causes the pressure to increase. Because the pressure inside the variable inside that vessel increases, we're going to be pushing up on our piston. So we've added here, we've added more gas. We're going to push up on that piston until the pressures are equal again. So as the volume increases, um, 
the number of gas particles is going to be the same. So because the pressure inside the vessel is greater than the external pressure, while the temperature remains constant, the volume will increase. And the volume will continue to increase until the internal and external pressures become equal. And so what this means is that there is a relationship between the number of moles of gas and the volume that gas takes up in a container. And so here we have a reaction where methane gas is being combusted according to the following balanced reaction. We want to determine the volume of oxygen required to completely combust 75 mils of methane at STP. And so what we're going to do, here's what this means, we're saying the number of moles of one gas compared to the volume of that gas is the same ratio as the number of moles compared to its volume. And this N is our coefficient. So on this side we have methane. We want to figure out how much oxygen on this side. So in our balanced chemical equation we have one mole of methane and our volume is 75 milliliters. For oxygen we have two moles of oxygen for every one mole of methane. We want to figure out the volume of oxygen required. And here we're just going to solve for V2. So I'm going to multiply both sides by V2 to get it out of my denominator. And I'm also going to multiply both sides by 75 just to clear my denominators out. And so 75 cancels with 75 on this side. I'm going to have V2 is equal to 2 times 75 is 150 milliliters. And so what this means is first we have to have twice as much oxygen as methane if we're going to burn all of that methane. Or we can look at our ratio. We can say it's a, it's a 2 to 1 ratio of oxygen to methane. So we need a 2 to 1 ratio for our volumes. So what this leads us to is the idea of molar volume. If it doesn't matter what kind of gas you have when you're measuring volumes and pressures and temperatures, then at both STP and SATP there's going to be a standard volume. And it's true for any set of conditions, but because STP and SATP are used so often, it's helpful to memorize these numbers or remember these numbers. So at STP, one mole of gas has a volume of 22.4 liters. It doesn't matter what kind of gas you're measuring. It could be hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, neon gas, doesn't matter. If it's at zero degrees Celsius and 101.325 kilopascals, it's going to take up 22.4 liters of space. Uh, the same idea for a gas at SATP, except that the volume's a little bit bigger because the gas is at a little bit warmer temperature. And so when we know molar volume, it allows us to speed up some of our calculations. Oops. So here's just a uh, conditions to memorize. At STP, our pressure, temperatures, and molar volume. And at SATP, same idea. So let's give it a go. We have an empty syringe with a mass. And when we fill it with pure oxygen, to a volume of 3 centimeters cubed, the mass of the syringe increases, and this should say grams. So the pressure inside the syringe is that, 99.5 kilopascals, when the temperature is 22.5. We want to determine the molar volume, or the volume of oxygen, at STP. So first we're going to find out the volume that's there, and then we're going to find out the molar volume.